Hi, everyone. Uh, so we are continuing today's sessions. Uh, this one is with Ivan talk, uh, talking about reactive JavaScripts. Uh, as usual, you can ask questions through the bot or after and enjoy the talk. Cool. Thank you. OK. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you all. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about reactive programming in JavaScript. So uh, that's kind of something new, but it's becoming really popular. So I hope that you will learn something new today. So uh, if someone can't hear me, raise your hand now. OK. Good. So sorry. Yeah. So this is me. I'm Ivan. I am software engineer in a company called WellTalk. And you can find me on Twitter and on my blog. I'm usually writing about things that I like and about reactive programming. So the first question I want to ask, uh, so it's obvious, uh, what is reactive programming? So I'd like to ask you, um, how many of you have ever heard about reactive programming? Please your, raise your hand. Oh, wow, a lot. So how, how many of you uh, really used reactive programming in some, some application? And how many of you really like that? OK, <laughs> so that's cool. So uh, what is reactive programming? Uh, I like this definition from Anders Staltz. So uh, reactive programming is a programming with asynchronized data streams. So uh, this definition should be simple. So we know what's programming. We know what's asynchronized. But what is a data stream? So that's the second thing. What's a data stream? Uh, Data stream is an endless sequence of uh, digital signals, or in our case, data packets. So imagine that you have endless sequence of some data that's coming inside your app and going through the app and going outside of the app. Uh, this is the, the picture of data stream. So we have packets of data or buffers with some numbers here, like 10, 20, 30, and so on. And that data is endless. Uh, this is my definition. So what's reactive programming in JavaScript in general? So it's abstraction of all async processes that we have in our application into the data streams. So basically, with uh, reactive programming helps us to abstract every, uh, everything that's async in our app uh, into the data streams and have one interface that will communicate with that data. So how we transform data and how we work th with the data uh, in general, so with the data streams. Here at the top, uh, yeah, if you can see this dot, we have one data stream. So imagine that this is the stream of the user clicks. So user has a mouse and he taps the button. So first here, we have a sequence of three clicks in, for example, 500 milliseconds. So user taps the button th for three times. Then he waits some time here, taps again twice, waits, and taps again. So that's a data stream that's coming from the user. We can use something like this. So this is a function. Of course, it doesn't work, but that's an example. Uh, so we use that click stream and throttle and send uh, an argument of uh, 500 seconds. That means we're kind of grouping the, uh, those clicks into buffers of data. So here, from those three clings, clicks, we have uh, one buffer of three clicks, second one of two, and one at the end. So uh, we did some uh, transformation here. And uh, reactive programming is not doing any mutation of the data, so we are creating a uh, new uh, new stream. So here we have this grouped data stream. So with that data stream, we can do usual things from uh, functional programming, like filtering, mapping, reducing, so on. So let's do a map here. So we want to go to each buffer here and get the size of that buffer. So for the first one, we have a size of 3. Second one. We have a size of two. And the last one is just a one. So here we, we made something that's useful for us, because we have a data stream of uh, buffers with numbers. So that's easy to, to, to work with. And then we can do something like this. 
we can filter, for example. So we just want to filter uh, to get the buffers in our new data stream uh, where the number is equal or, or is uh, larger or equal to two. So from a stream where we have three buffers, we will get the stream uh, with just two, with two and three here. So this is just introduction. How can we work with the uh, data streams in uh, general? So when you saw this example here, here's an obvious question. Uh, so why do we need this reactive thing? And why did someone create this for us? So there are a couple reasons I found. So first of all, when you're building your app, you probably have a lot of external service calls or, so, or some si side effects. For example, if you're building a front-end app, you have user input, input inside, uh, inside some fields, you have HTTP requests, you have WebSockets, and so on. So um, if you ever build an app with all those side effects, you know how it's hard to, to work with all of them. So reactive programming gives us really simple uh, interfaces to work uh, with all those side effects in the same way. Next thing, it's a better performance. Uh, I will talk later about some new framework for reactive programming, and I was comparing reacting programming inside that framework with, for example, React, uh, using many uh, HTTP requests in the ba background, and I was getting really good performance with uh, the reactive programming. Uh, next thing, it's highly testable. So uh, reactive programming is about functional programming. So we have pure functions that just take the stream, work with, with that stream, and return a new one. So it's really simple to, to test the data, you, to test those functions. You don't need to mock anything. You just import the function, add some stream inside, and then expect to receive a new one with the data, whatever you, you, you want to expect. Four things, so it's abstraction over all async processes. As I said, uh, JavaScript uh, is an async language, and uh, we have a bunch of async processes there, so we want to have one simple interface uh, for all those processes. It's a predictable code, so when you read the code, you immediately know what that code is doing. You need to, talk, to think about where's the data coming from, what are the data models. So it's really predictable that you're just circling around the app. And it's extendable code, so as I said, just pure functions, you can compose them, you can write one function, then the second one is accepting, is taking that uh, stream from the first one, and so on, so you can um, easily extend your code. Next thing, it's observable. So if you ever read about uh, reactive programming, you saw this word observable. So what's that? That's just uh, official, uh, official terminology for the stream. So when they say observable, that's simply said the, the stream. And observables has, have many helper functions like filter map, so on, that will help you to work with those streams. So reactive programming in JS. Uh, what we have there, so what modules can we use to uh, extend our uh, JavaScript apps and use uh, reactive paradigm? So the first one is RxJS. It's the most popular library, and it's uh, coming from the reactive group of uh, frameworks. So you also have uh, Rx Java, Rx Ruby, and so on. So and all of those, uh, all those frameworks are using the same interface. So if you learn RxJS, you can easily work with Rx Java. And RxJS is the biggest one from this list. So it has, I think, three, 300 of helper functions. You will probably just use 20 in your app. So um, the, I think that there is no really big point in using this one because uh, it will give you many things, but you, you will just use a small percent of that. Second one is Mojs. It has best performances, and it's smaller than RxJS. Uh, they have uh, numbers to prove that. So uh, if you go to Mojs website, you will see the comparison, and uh, Mojs is really the fastest. There's the Bacon JS. It's a mature, highly tested, so it's a, uh, it's also a good choice. And the last last one, it's Xtreme. So uh, that's the newest, and it's the smallest. I think 21 kilobytes, something like that. It has about uh, 30 helper function, functions, 
and it's really cool. I recommend it. So, since we are talking about uh, JavaScript, I need to mention React, of course. So, uh, what about React? People always ask me, is React reactive? So, you have that word React inside the reactive. Uh, React is not uh, reactive at all, but there are some uh, stuff that we can use to extend it and make it reactive and work with streams. So uh, some things that React is not capable to do, so some uh, cons when it comes to reactive programming. Uh, React is not built with the data flow in mind. So if you want to use React, you need to write some custom code that will uh, say how the data will circle around the app. Uh, people, are, people built the Redux, for example, that should help you to have one state and then take the data from that state and so on. Uh, side effects. So if you ever used React and Redux, you probably use Sagas. So that's one more module that helps you to work with side effects. And the functional programming. So uh, React is uh, not built using fu functional pro programming paradigm. You have object-oriented design there. You have many this and bindings and uh, classes. So that those are the cons of the React when it comes to reactive programming. Uh, we can fix that. So uh, this is the logo of RxJS that you saw a couple slides before. Uh, so. Uh, React can be integrated with RxJS, so you're getting a big bundle of data there. But you know we can we can work with that. Uh, but uh, it needs something in the middle. So this is Redux. So when you combine those three guys here, you can really get a powerful uh, stack and build up really good applications. Because uh, you will have the async state that's taking the data from the RxJS, so everything that's coming from the side, HTTP requests, user typings, you can fill that inside your state, and React will take the data from the state, and it will do re-rendering, and so on. So, but there is something new I really recommend and I really like. This is Cycle.js. So it's a new, really small library that does the same thing that React's React, Redux, and RxJS are doing. And the Cycle.js is built by Understaltz, so that uh, the uh, reactive programming definition I uh, posted a couple slides uh, before uh, is from him, so he's a really great developer and I learned a lot uh, from his presentation, so go and check him on YouTube. So, um, what is uh, Cycle.js? Uh, this is from official website, so uh, uh, Cycle.js is a functional and uh, reactive JavaScript framework for predictable code. So that's exactly what we need. We need functional framework that can use a reactive uh, paradigm and we can write a predictable code so we don't need to think about the data flow. Data will just circle and we will uh, transform that data in render awesome interfaces. So. Uh, as you saw for React, those are the cons. For uh, Cycle.js, uh, those things are the pros. So, data flow. Uh, Cycle.js is built with a data flow in mind. So, as the name says, we have a cycle. So, you build the uh, functions that you want to use, basically the components. And uh, Cycle.js is doing all the data circling for you. You just transform the data and render interfaces. Side effects in Cycle, we will see later, uh, you have the uh, drivers. So those are the plugins for HTTP, for DOM, for WebSockets, where you can um, uh, listen to those uh, streams and take that data using the same interface. And the functional programming. So uh, in Cycle.js, you just write pure functions uh, that are highly testable. And there is no this and bindings, so just functions. Some of the main uh, features of the Cycle.js are Cycle.js, as I said, it's a func functional, so just write pure functions and compose them. It's reactive. Uh, it's highly testable, so testing 
Uh, I was able, uh, in one of my projects where I use Cycle.js, I was able to get 100% coverage. So all my functions were tested. And I was really sure that if I change something, I don't break whole, the whole app. So it's composable, just pure functions, put them inside, and it will work. Uh, explicit data flow. So uh, you immediately know how's the data circling around. No need to write some, some custom uh, modules for that. And it's made for large code bases. Uh, people say that React is also made for a large code bases. But when you start working with React, you see you need to make one big folder with components, and every component has styles, and so on. Here, I just made uh, make one, uh, one folder, and then put all my functions, Cycle.js functions, inside. So with fi uh, just files, and that's it. Or maybe I just separate them into smaller uh, folders. And that's it. So it's, easy, it's really easy to navigate through, through the code base. Uh, this is how Cycle.js works. So here at the top, we have the main function. So it's the main function that's called when the Cycle.js starts. And you see here, we have the pure data flow. So the data is just coming inside and going outside. So they, the streams that are coming inside are, are called sources. We work with them. You see here, we transform the data and make a new stream that's coming outside as a sync. What's this? So those are the drivers. So we have the DOM driver, HTTP driver, other drivers. So we uh, basically has driver for every side effect that you need. So as an example, user will type something in the text box, text field. You will get that data here. Transform it, for example, you want to make a calculator, so it says 1 plus 1. You will sum that somewhere here and then return that stream where one buffer will say 2. And then go back to the DOM. DOM will uh, update some label or something like that. Yeah, so this is Cycle.js. So this is just one function that runs a uh, whole library. As I said, Cycle is really small. So you just need this run function that's coming from a cycle. You specify your main function, so the main component, and an object of drivers. And that's it. The drivers, there are a bunch of them, as I said. So we have a HTTP driver, DOM driver, WebSocket, local storage, HTML5 notification driver, uh, history API driver, and so on. And it's really easy to make a driver, so if you go to, to the uh, Cycle.js repo and you can't find the driver for what you need. Yeah, there is a really good documentation, so you can make your own driver. OK, so um, Cycle.js official packages. So yeah, as I said, Cycle.js is just one function. It's this one here, run. But you need a couple more smaller modules to make everything work. So if you want to, of course, you, you're building a web app, so you need a DOM, you need a to be able to work with the browser. So uh, this is a DOM uh, driver, and it's a collection of drivers that work with DOM. And also has a HTML driver, so a virtual DOM driver that's based on Snap DOM uh, library. It has a, a history API, so if you want to work with the history API, go back, go forward, and so on. It has a HTTP driver, so the same way you will get HTTP requests, and you will use the same driver to send those HTTP requests. <laughs> it has this awesome thing. It's isolate. So it's one function that helps you isolate your uh, components. So when you compose your components, put one inside another, you can use this as isolate function and easily uh, send the data stream inside your subcomponent and easily get the data stream that's coming from your component. So those three functions here are mostly the same. So let's start from this one. This is a run function. Uh, it's uh, for apps mi uh, built with the Xtreme. So Understats also made the Xtreme, and it's compatible with the uh, native run function that comes with the cycle. If you want to use Most.js or RxJS, you need to import those two. So instead of using this one, you need to use Most or RxJS run to make them work. I think that they build also couple more for some different modules. So whatever uh, reactive library you want to use, there's probably a module for integrating that in the cycle. 
Uh, this is also something new. So uh, when we're building our functions, we need some cool way, some pattern to separate the logic inside those functions. So here, this is your main function, a function, a component. And uh, you're taking some source from DOM. And uh, you're returning the stream, again, to the DOM sync. It's, uh, there is a simple way called model view intent pattern to separate the whole logic in your main function. So intent, uh, that's the part of your code that's listening for the, from the input stream. Model, that's where the magic happens. So you transform the data and make a new stream that's going uh, to the view. And the view, so you here map through the stream that's coming from the model. And uh, so map and replace the buffers you have uh, with some uh, virtual DOM functions like div, paragraph, and so on. And then from this view, it's going back to the DOM in um, a stream that has uh, basically vir virtual DOM functions that will later render something in the DOM. Uh, OK, so let's see an example how this cycle thing is working. So here, uh, this is basically a one component, so one whole app. So uh, we'll focus more on a main function here. But let's see. At the top, we are importing some stuff. So we are importing uh, access from the Xstream, run from the cycle run library, and the button paragraph from the cycle DOM. We also need a DOM driver. So uh, here at the bottom, when we have our main function ready, we are sending the object of the uh, drivers that we want to use. So we are basically connecting with the driver and connecting our main function with those drivers. Here, in this example, we will just use a DOM one. We call make DOM driver function and specify which div we want to use. So same thing with the, like with the view, React, Angular. You pick one div in your HTML code and assign it here, and the whole cycle app will be rendered inside that div. This is how, I mean, it's a simple counter app. So this is how the app uh, looks when you run it. Let's see. So this is the main function. Here we have a couple things. So you see we have separated our code into the model view intent. So let's go. And yeah, at the bottom, we are returning back to the driver, the DOM stream that we want to be rendered. Let's see. So this is the intent. Here, uh, yeah, one more thing, sorry. S uh, by the convention, when we make a variable that's a stream, we put this dollar, dollar sign at the end. So that's just a convention. So when the, someone is reading your code and see this action variable, he knows that the uh, dollar sign uh, means that this is a stream. So here, we'll, uh, we're using the merge function for, from the X, X stream. It's really simple. So you have two streams, and then you want to merge them into one. We want to merge these two streams. So from the source, DOM source, so the stream that's coming from the DOM, we're selecting the decrement button, listening for all click events, and then we are mapping. So uh, we will get a stream of clicks. So you saw at the start uh, how that stream looks. So basically, you have a buffers. Uh, some data inside, but you don't care what's inside. And you want to replace uh, that buffer with the uh, number. So when we get a, a buffer from a decrement stream, we'll replace it with a minus one. When it comes from the increment stream, we'll replace it with a plus one. And at the end, this action stream looks like this. A stream with the minus and plus one uh, numbers inside as a buffers. So and that's, as you see, that uh, we can work with that because uh, from a buffer with, from a stream with buff click buffers, we have created a stream with uh, numbers that are us usable in other parts of our code. So the model, this is where the magic happens. As I said, we're making the count stream, so we want to see how many times user clicked on, uh, on a buttons, and we want to have that inside one stream. So we'll take the action stream, the stream that has minus one and plus ones, and we'll use this great function fold. So uh, it gets the uh, callback function with the ACC, so that's accumulator, and the X.
that's something that comes uh, from this action stream. So at the start, we say that ACC is zero. And when something comes uh, in from the action stream, we take that as X and uh, sum that to the ACC. So for example, at the start, the ACC will be zero. We then add plus one, it will be one. Ag then again, plus one, it will be two. Then reduce one, it will be one again, and so on. So here we have created a count stream of data that can be useful now in our uh, view part. Here in the view part, we're making the VDOM stream. So what's this doing? As I said, just mapping through the count stream that will have some numbers inside, so the sum of the clicks. We're just mapping, and for every that buffer with a number, we'll make a div. So uh, this is the um, virtual DOM library called SnipeDOM. Uh, it's really easy to integrate the JSX if you're used to JSX and React. So here we make a div, add three children, a button that says class dec decrement and label, again increment, and the paragraph with the counter and the count uh, that's currently coming from a stream. So how's that working? Here we have an example. So you just click, and that's it. When you click, uh, so the streams are endless. And they are connected with the app. So when you start clicking, the data is coming in the app. You're transforming the data and then giving, uh, giving that data back uh, to the DOM as uh, virtual DOM code. So uh, also, this is the thing that people always ask me is how to use the CSS with this virtual DOM library. So it's really simple. Where we have a button, so you can send second argument as a style, and then use object like this, where you specify background color, width, height, and that's it. OK, so as I said, uh, you saw how can we handle the, uh, the clicks, so using that input stream. Uh, let's see how can we handle the HTTP request, because that's the second most important thing when you build the app. You probably have some API, and you want to send post and get requests. OK, so here is our app. At the top, we need to add one more thing. So we also need to use HTTP driver. And then at the bottom, just next to the DOM driver, we add make HTTP driver. And that's it. Here in the sources, we'll have, in the sources object, we'll have one more property called DOM. And we'll be able to use that. At the bottom here, when we return the object, we need to return the requests um, request, uh, stream. So this is the main function. And this is the first part of our function. So uh, we want to create a request model. We're using Xtreme again. And we are making, so we are making periodic buffers in our uh, stream. So every second we'll add a buffer there, and uh, we'll map that buffer to this object here. So the object contains the URL, for example, localhost, some API that you have uh, running locally and want to fetch data from it, and the category. We can also add method. Uh, the default method is get. We can add post, put, delete, and so on. And why the category? Uh, with the HTTP uh, driver, you will get all the requests that your app is sending. So if your app wants to fetch uh, CSS or some image, uh, you will also get that request inside your app. So you need to specify a name, so a category where you can filter uh, through that stream and just get the, uh, the buffers uh, that you, are, you sent as a request. So you want to get them as a response. Let's see that here. So inside the VDOM, we're going through the HTTP and just selecting the API. So we, as I said, we set category to be equal H, uh, API. We just want to get the API uh, buffers from those streams. We need to flatten that stream. So uh, inside the HTTP driver, we will get uh, multiple streams. And we want to make them a one stream, because it's easier to work when you just have one stream. Then here, we will. Uh, just take the body from the response. And here at the bottom, we'll do the same thing. So map through the body and just render that here as uh, some response. We have one more thing here. It's start with. When you run your app, uh, your HTTP stream is empty. So before, thank you. <laughs> so before you, 
start receiving some data, uh, you will have an empty stream, and this here will be undefined or null. So you want to set something to start with. So the first buffer in a stream that's going to be rendered is this one. This result of the response will be equal to empty string here. That's something to make the, 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 the whole thing user-friendly. You probably don't want your users to see undefined or empty object or something like that. Uh, as I said, working with components in Cycle.js is really simple. Uh, this is an example. So we have that one big main function. We want to render something inside. For example, you're rendering whole page as a main function. You want menu navigation or some form. Just write that form separately, test it, write test code for, for that, and then, then import, so compose inside the, uh, your main app. This is the code that's doing all the magic. As I said, this isolate, isolate uh, uh, function is coming from this cycle slash isolate uh, sources. We are making an object of the sources that we want to inject inside our child component. And here, let's make a child component. So just isolate the component and send the sources as argument inside your component. And that's it. Your component will give you the things when the component is, do is done with the uh, uh, with uh, data transform. So it's uh, really simple. You don't have life cycle methods like in uh, React. So it's just uh, changing when the data is coming inside it. Here we are taking the VDOM. For example, you want to render the HTML that you, you got from the component. And let's say we were doing some calculations so you can get the stream of values. So you are making a calculator and this child component is doing calculations, so you also want to get the value and render inside the main component. Okay, so uh, we are almost at the end. So uh, what's the conclusion here? What have we learned today? So the reactive uh, paradigm is an old paradigm. So I have read that uh, it's coming from the 70s, but people haven't really used that some commercial projects. Uh, here, uh, with the Cycle.js, with the RSJS, and all those integration in JavaScript, we can really use this in a new way and create awesome apps. It's not for everyone. So if you're building some static apps, static web pages, or maybe blogs, or something like that, without so many interactions between the user and the app, between the app and some backend or sockets, uh, you, you probably don't need this. You can just build. You can use React or any other library. Uh, it's perfect for real-time apps, so that require high performance. So if you, as I said, if you're taking a lot of data from some ex external services, you can make charts that work in real time. You can make some other interactions with the user. Uh, yesterday, I saw a guy who's making some tools. I read that on the internet. So he shared with us that he's making some tools that are tracking the weather and things like that. So through the web sockets, he integrated his simple cycle app uh, with those tools. And he could just sit uh, home and watch the TV where he can see all the charts changing. And that's really amazing. Uh, we write testable and predictable code. So uh, as I said, functional programming, uh, data flow is pure. And uh, functions are pure. So just uh, every time you put something in the function, the same thing should uh, be returned. And the most important thing, and why I like all those stuff that we have, that I've been talking about, is that we have uh, one interface for everything that's async in our app. Uh, before we are done, uh, Cycle.js is not that perfect, so uh, there are some cons. It's a community, so uh, it's really new framework. So if you have some issues, some problems, there are not so many people in the world that are using Cycle and that are able to help you. So that number is increasing and that's changing. But for the start, if you're building something big and you run into some unexpected error, it will be hard to find someone that can help you. And also, it will be hard to find some teammates that are experienced with Cycle if you're building some big app for a client. You will need to spend some time learning that new paradigm, you and your teammates, and that will take time because this is different from the way that we are building 
apps now. And of course, some apps don't need this. So uh, we can build uh, every app, every app that you can imagine with Cycle, but sometime it will be overweight, so you, you, you don't need this for blocks and so on. And what's next? So uh, go visit cycle.js cycle.js.org website. There is a great documentation. If you want to try it, you have a you have bunch of examples. You can really l learn everything from a website. Also, Anders Stoltz, he's a great guy, and you can watch his talks too. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so we have time for some questions. Do we have any question? For any you? question? I will be here somewhere, so if you want to maybe see some code or something like that, go find me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if you have any questions, come back. Thank you. Thank you.